I'm Saeed Chaudhary, the uh, head of the OSPO, or Open Source Programs Office at Carnegie Mellon University. This session is Early Lessons Learned from the University Program, University Open Source Programs Offices. Uh, I'm joined by, there we go. Uh, I'm joined by some other leaders of uh, OSPOs at uh, University of California, Santa Cruz, uh, University of Vermont, and Johns Hopkins University. Mike Nolan from the Rochester Institute of Technology and Daniel Schoen from the University or St. Louis University could not be here, but they sent notes, so I will be reading their uh, comments. So uh, very briefly, one definition of an OSPO that we use in a guide that's available about university OSPOs is it's a community convener and a center of competency to help uh, manage, curate, and share open source software. And then what your institution wishes to do with that, if you can reach that state, is part of what you'll hear from this panel. So each of us is going to give uh, a little bit of context around lessons learned in these early days, and then some of the accomplishments that map to those lessons learned. But we're really hoping to have time for your questions and some discussion. A Little bit of background and context. Uh, the Alfred P. Sloan Foundation has funded six institutions that are represented on this panel to form open source programs offices or OSPOs and has announced a program to fund an additional set uh, that came out in February, and I believe they're starting to make some of their decisions around that. Uh, we've created a guide uh, or a playbook for creating university uh, open source programs offices or exploring open source software within your institution. It's available at this link. Uh, there was an informational session related to the Sloan program uh, that was recorded and it's available at that YouTube link. I put those links into the session description in uh, SCED or SHED or however you say it. Um, so you can take a look there and see them, but I'm also assuming these slides will be available. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to Stephanie to kick us off. Hi, I'm Stephanie Ligi. I am at the U uh, University of California in Santa Cruz, and I have to be really careful here not to say UC all the time, because I know that means something else here. Um, but so we're uh, University of California in Santa Cruz. Uh, we Just as a quick kind of lead into the lessons learned, we've actually been do had the Center for Research and Open Source Software, um, which was established in 2015. Um, and so a lot of the lessons learned um, kind of predate some of the OSPO work that we've done more recently. Um, and so, a bit, so this is a bit more of a, um, a, a merger of that, because a lot of the lessons we learned, we learned from the center that we started at, at, at UC Santa, uh, UCSC is um, uh, kind of led into why we realized what we really needed to, to really focus on was creating an OSPO uh, within, within the university. So, um, so th those first two bullet points I wanted to look at, um, which are sh kind of showing the value of open source and uh, that open source can be a catalyst for uh, industry research is directly related for, to what we did at, at Cross. Um, and um, so part of the story of Cross is that we had a very successful uh, PhD student who was able to um, create a startup based on their open source uh, the open source research as part of their dissertation, which uh, ended up being the Ceph uh, open source storage system. Um, so that was Sage Weil, and Sage Weil was able to um, uh, sell that or sell his company to Red Hat for a good chunk of money, and then gave us money back in order to kind of recreate that uh, process for other students. So other students who didn't have the ability to kind of work on their project after um, after. Uh, after they graduated. So in the interest of time, I won't go totally into how that structure worked, but what we did learn from that is that getting our, um, getting our leadership on board was super helpful and having that success, that huge success of Ceph, really sh did show a value. Now, not everybody can have that, but there are ways, and we can talk about it maybe during the Q&A, of how you show um, your, lead your university leadership that, they're, that having open source and having something that um, helps curate it and helps work, uh, um, uh, uh, bolster it really is helpful and has value to the university. Um, we also showed that, and a part of that work in, um, at Cross really brought in a lot of industry support and again, you know, went back to the value of open source. Um, we also, as we especially moved into becoming an OSPO and not just a research center, we started seeing how we were able to match uh, mentors, students, folks who wanted to work on open source projects but didn't know who they were, and we were kind of a nice central uh, organization to work through, and I'll talk a little bit about that um, in, uh, in kind of our accomplishments. 
um, we were we learned to be very ready for great new um, opportunities and uh, especially through funding models, fun funding opportunities we never thought about until the OSPO uh, kind of got started and then all of a sudden we were like in a really well placed, particularly a lot of the NSF funding that I think Martin talked about uh, yesterday. We were actually, oh, this is, we're actually really well suited now to, to work on that. Um, and we also learned that we shouldn't be stuck in our ideas about how the model should work. Uh, Cross worked out nice for a time being, but we see that actually moving forward uh, we're probably going to change the model, maybe be placed differently to where we thought we were going to be in the university, and being flexible on that was really important. Uh, so using existing models, but also being ready to change in case, in case, um, in case things don't work out the way you think. Uh, quick accomplishments. Um, I'm really proud and really excited about the fact that we're bringing, uh, sorry again, I put UC, that's University of California, um, a University of California-wide uh, kind of collaboration and network that we're working on right now. We have a couple people in the room that are part of that. Um, and uh, one of our programmatic activities is um, efforts with regard to mentorship, the, that matchmaking I was talking about, and we've been able to expand that to any UC that's interested, so any UC or sorry, any University of California researcher who has an open source project can, um, can be part of our program, which helps um, match them with students from around the world. It's kind of part of the Google Summer of Code, but we have our own um, activity as well. And that's expanded significantly over the last two years as we opened it up to more of the University of California, not just University, not just Santa Cruz specific. Um, We've definitely seen much more sustainability through broadening our funding opportunities. We are one of the, um, we were lucky to get uh, the Pharos RCN um, as well, and we're, uh, we are starting up the Summer of Reproducibility this year as part of that, and um, the NSF project that was mentioned yesterday, or NSF uh, funding that was mentioned yesterday. And um, well, it's been, that's been a great uh, helping us booster some of these mentorship programs that we have. Um, and um, we're definitely be also part of the uh, NSF POSE. We have a phase one grant for that, which is also building uh, open source ecosystems. And all of that, again, was something that we probably wouldn't have been able to do if we hadn't started with the OSPO. It wouldn't necessarily have fit for us within our, our just our research center. Um, we're really excited also about a lot of the um, diversity and community building activities that we've been able to start doing, under the, especially in the last two years under the OSPO. Again, the um, open source research experience is part of the mentorship program I mentioned earlier. Um, and we're actually starting one that's specifically focused on minoritized communities, ones that you don't see very often in, in open source. Um, and that's this year, and it's actually a hybrid uh, program, which is the four weeks at U University uh, UC Santa Cruz and uh, four weeks uh, remote, so it's really great to bring students in, give them sort of a background in open source, and then let them kind of work in a, what would be an open source community, which are typically remote. Um, we also, uh, just to interest of time, sorry, give myself uh, one second more, uh, we're actually seeing a lot of uh, uh, opportunity, especially the last year, of building relationships beyond just open source, but also open science. We have the OSPO++ folks who are all part of, um, you know, the group like Said and a bunch of other folks that, uh, that we work with on uh, university OSPOs, as well as the to-do group, which is an, um, an open source, so members of that, which is an um, OSPOs from industry. And then we've also recently started working with the um, open source science initiative, which is part of NumFocus, or uh, supported by NumFocus. And we also have been members of the Linux Foundation for quite some time, and that's a really helpful um, as part of the work, that, the, the helping us support kind of integration with um, open source communities more widely. So. That's it. <clears throat> Hello, my name is Kendall Fortney. I run the OSPO in the University of Vermont. We are the only research institution in Vermont. So it's a very small state, and we get to be in the middle of that. Um, <clears throat> we were funded by the Sloan Foundation at the beginning of last year. Um, I have been in the role since uh, about mid-April. Um, and in that time, we've kind of went through a couple of different phases. But before I get into that, I'm just kind of curious, how many people have used open source software here? This is awesome. So I do this when I actually go to classes to ask how many of them actually do this. And how many of you are involved in like open access initiatives inside of what you're doing? How many are here because you're interested about creating an OSPO? 
Okay, all of you raise hands, come talk to us at the end of this. Um, okay, so <clears throat> one of the things that we, we kind of went through when we were beginning this is I came from working industry. Uh, I worked in tech companies for 12 years in startups, and for me, you know, understanding what open source was changed when I got into academia. Um, and that was a big part, is being how inclusive to think about what is included in open source. That's open access, that's open science. It's open work, it's open practices. There's a lot of things that are not just software, which is where the, I came from. So that was a very big learning curve, and that was really useful to kind of identify where we wanted to focus. Um, it was also very revealing, like I've worked in large companies. Uh, universities are very different. <laughs> they are large companies, but they're also even more you know, um, siloed and structured in ways that don't talk to each other. So it's like a really complex, complex system to navigate. So that was a, a definitely like both a learning curve to understand that, and also like once you have the understanding, you can work well with those organizations, with those groups. You identify the right people. You have those connect conversations. You actually can move fairly quickly I mean, it's not like startup level quick, but still you move fairly quickly once you actually have those connections and you find people that are champions of what you're talking about. <clears throat> and it's also really interesting to see how incentives around open work is different for different groups. So like we were kind of going through and be like, what are our user groups in products, product speak? Like, you know, our user groups can be staff, it can be faculty. St you know, you talk about students, you have undergrad, you have graduate, you have postdocs. Like all of them have different incentives for doing open work. So like if I'm talking to staff, it's gonna be different than I talk to faculty and really tailoring our messages for those different groups to meet the things that they're interested in is really important, which is hence the question I just asked you. You're interested in all of it, which is kind of sweet for me. Um, funding is, has a long lead time too. So like, you know, when you're working in this space, like it's been a while to understand, like dig into how, how you get grants, how you fund organization, how you make it sustainable. Um, OSPOs in industry, in companies, are things that are like loss prevention, not loss prevention, they're basically risk mitigation, um, how you make sure that you know what licenses are on the, the software you're using and also like developing software that you use in a company. In universities, it's kind of a different aspect of what we're trying to do. So how you develop a sustainable business model, for lack of a better word, to keep your OSPO alive. And like we've been having conversations about what that actually looks like and it's evolving, like where can we go, what can we do? And the same thing, you know, building personal connections. Um, I have, like, I track all the people I talk to, so I kind of have an idea if I want to go back to talk to someone, I can look them up in my little, like, CRM, like my custom, customer relationship management system that I know who I've gone to. And I've, I have over 140 conversations at this point in a year of people across every college at the university in, I think, prob I mean, honestly, I have yet to find a list of all the offices, <laughs> so <laughs> most of them, I think. And, and like about 40 of different community organizations outside of the university. So like building that broad coalition at a certain point, like it starts coalescing and you're like, I wanna focus on these specific groups because they're the ones that are gonna advance missions. But like inevitably I'll be like, oh, I'm doing this thing. I'm like, oh, I know someone that can help you with this. And that's really useful because a lot of what OSPOs are kind of like this, this, net, this center point of a, of a network where we're connecting pieces from all sorts of places from each other, like from across different universities to inside the community to across departments. We kind of live in this nether space between things. And it's also like the diversification of ways to support OSPO is like you don't just rely on grants um, because that is honestly risky. Like how do you actually develop other ways to support what we're doing? How do we tie ourselves to vital institutions inside of the university that help things advance? Like how you build that? And I don't have, you know, like a nice checklist for you yet but we're definitely figuring out ways that are actually gonna make that a little more sustainable. It's taken longer than I thought it would because the nature of the complexity of living, living inside of that space. I think I kind of talked a little bit as I was talking through some of these points, but like we've been working on piloting uh, open journal software for use of the university. We've been working on trying to build large scale public data repositories, which has its own set of interesting challenges and opportunities inside of it. We've done, uh, we have like 15, so a lot of the work we do is with tech transfer. So we're working with them on projects. So if someone's like, hey, I have this cool idea, I wanna turn this into something interesting, and I'm brought in to be like, okay, so that's awesome. Is open source part of your overall goal? Is it part of a subset of goal? There's business strategies they can use to apply open source. Those kind of things we were doing with like, I have 15 different projects. Some of them are gonna convert fully to open source. Some of them are gonna be a little bit of it. Some of them are not, and that's completely fine. Um, we're involved in, well, actually this is now nine grant applications. Luckily, I'm not the PI in any of those. I get to kind of tag on everyone else's work of writing. I'm okay with that. Um, and we're also working on developing a, a workshop talking about open practices across different disciplines. Because openness in software is different than open in open research. It's different in open design. It's like kind of bringing those people together and be like, how do we understand that ecosystem? How do we share what we've learned in that way and see how that goes? Um, and we, we've done a bunch of different class lectures and going to students and, and talking to them about different ways of doing this, um, having a lot of fun with, you know, t doing the things that I do in industry, right? Like how you use Git, how you use some of the software you'd use out the side of the spaces to do 
work in open source projects. And again, connected to over 120 people. Man, the number just keeps growing. 120 people and uh, a lot of different organizations inside of the, the university. And that's me. Thanks, Kendall. And I appreciate you asking the question around who's, who here is, is looking to you know, create an OSPO, who is who's doing open source already. Because I, I really tailored the, the points that I, I pulled out here to, to those who are in that position, right? Who, who really are thinking about uh, either building an OSPO or just doing, working with an OSPO in some way. Um, so my name is Bill Brannon. I have the pleasure of managing the OSPO at Johns Hopkins University. Uh, so to start, it's helpful to recognize that in most cases, open source work is already happening um, at your institutions. The chart on the left side, left side uh, of the slide illustrates code contributions by organizational groups at JHU. So you can see that there are a few groups that contribute heavily. Uh, these groups are often the most visible, easy to find, but towards the top of the chart there are many very small lines, which are those engaging in open source in smaller ways. So not all open source work is large scale application development. Much of it is simply making existing tools a little bit better or building small things, scripts and things. Um, considering this range, discovering the individuals and teams doing open source work can be challenging. We've found that one of the most effective methods of discovery is to provide tools and resources that these teams would like to use and, uh, and then make that known. This encourages those teams to reach out, allowing us to talk to them, understand what they're doing, the kind of work that they're engaged in. Uh, picking battles is important for an OSPO because uh, generally it's a small group of people trying to do a lot of things, don't try to do everything. Uh, start by identifying the primary impact that you'd like the OSPO to have, then define the strategies and goals that get you going in that direction, match that capacity to the team, and, and then you can grow from there. Uh, expect multiple forms of, engage of engagement. The needs of a project depend on a variety of factors and not all projects pro progress in the same way. Providing effective support requires listening to the teams uh, and then matching resources to those needs. Don't assume that all open source projects start the same way and that they progress along the same paths. It's often not a linear progression, uh, so having some awareness of the fact that there's going to be variety is, is really helpful. Don't be afraid to experiment. Um, early on in the life of the OSPO at, at Hopkins, we conducted an experiment with gracious funding from the Sloan Foundation to create a free and open source contributor fund. Uh, this is an approach that has been used successfully in the corporate world to provide funding for open source work. And unfortunately, when we tried this, there was not yet significant awareness of the OSPO at JHU, so participation was lower than, than we had hoped. Really, we had hoped that the FOSS fund would attract attention and bring engagement to the OSPO, but what we discovered is that we really needed to build the community first. So when you experiment, sometimes you're gonna learn things that you didn't expect and your, the outcomes are going to be different, but we do intend to, to uh, revisit the, the FOSS fund experiment soon now that we have broader awareness uh, of the OSPO at, at JHU. So sometimes you can circle back around to those and, and give it another shot. Uh, next, building your Rolodex. Uh, you're gonna be asked questions that you don't know how to answer and expect that to happen, which means that you need to have people that you can reach out to that you know that uh, can answer those questions or help you answer those questions uh, as they come up. And this really reinforces the value of the OSPO as a point of collaboration. Your list of contacts are going to include people within your institution, outside of your institution. Groups like OSPO++ are a fantastic place to start building that kind of network. And then, Really, collaboration is, is the key to this. Um, so much of the work of the OSPO comes down to making the right connections. Collaboration is required for an open source project to be successful, the same is true for an OSPO. An example at Hopkins, uh, as Kendall mentioned, actually is, is working with the tech transfer office to, uh, to partner in discussions around transitioning to open source, uh, licensing, those kinds of things, recognizing that we each bring different perspectives to the table and collaboration is really what drives that work. So moving on to some of the accomplishments. Oops. It's useful to start out by really calling out the establishment of the university-based OSPO, which, which is not a small thing. 
Um, an open source programs office in a university was a novel idea just a few years ago. This is really still new. Significant work was required to define the value and purpose of an OSPO in an academic setting, to build support, to establish funding approaches, to blaze the trail. This work was done by those on this stage uh, and others who saw the, that coordinated effort to support open source can bring significant value to universities. Those looking to create an OSPO today now have examples to point to uh, at other institutions, a guide to follow, a community to lean on, and funding that's available. This goes way beyond any one OSPO and really is a major uh, accomplishment of the community at large. So I, I mentioned a moment ago that the discovery of open source work at Hopkins was made easier by offering tools and resources that are valued by open source teams. So at the top of this list for Hopkins is the enterprise level uh, code development resources available through the GitHub campus program. GitHub is well known. It's a very practical resource that provides clear value both for software development work and for instruction. So by providing this as a service, as an example, uh, we not only gain awareness of open source projects and, and other work that's going on at Hopkins, but we're able to utilize those tools to create metrics and create charts like this, the one you saw on the last slide. The OSPO also facilitates uh, discussion. This seems simplistic, but really is a core tenant of, of the OSPO. I mean, the OSPO itself is intended to be an organizational API, a pathway to information and collaboration both inside and outside of the institution. The JHU OSPO has done this by sponsoring workshops, bringing in experts and licensing, community building, assessment, governance, and project sustainability to help project teams to take the next step in their evolution and also by working with a community center in Baltimore to help them discover how open source can benefit their work and the surrounding neighborhoods around the Hopkins campuses. The OSPO also actively builds open source software. At JHU, the OSPO is paired with the Digital Research and Curation Center, which provides engineering resources to facilitate the creation and development of software to meet institutional needs. Actively participating in open source development allows those in the OSPO to more easily relate to the needs of open source project teams and to better understand their needs and be prepared to provide help. And, and finally, the OSPO has taken an active role in teaching of open source methods by partnering with Stephen Wally of Microsoft as he teaches a course at Hopkins called Open Source Software Engineering, also known as Semesters of Code, where students learn how open source development is done and are required to participate in real world open source projects with mentors to guide their learning. Thank you. So as I'd mentioned, Mike Nolan, who's the Associate Director for the Open Work Group, or Open RIT, at, at, at RIT, could not be here. But he sent me some notes, so I'm just going to read them for you. Uh, firstly, as I'm sure it was discovered by many of our colleagues, open source software development on campus uh, by developed by faculty, students, and staff is not something that is easy to track or manage. The university is an environment where research and knowledge production happens chaotically. That's his word, not mine. Uh, unless work is being specifically funded, no one registers their work, and when they do, tracking the licensing is not something that is done in a structured way. Many faculty, students, and staff are generally interested in the virtue of sharing their work due to the perception of increased impact through sharing. However, most have little to no understanding of licensing requirements or the requirements and best practices of managing a community of contributors around their work. Furthermore, when it comes to utilizing contributions to open work in the process of tenure and promotion, many committees evaluating tenure and promotion cases do not understand how to evaluate the impact of these contributions and often undervalue them because of this. Finally, the types of works produced across the university are many and often intersecting. Faculty will often produce data, code, writing, and more as part of their research, and each of these works face different types of collaboration. Furthermore, as a university office, we provide services not just to the faculty doing research, but to those teaching as well as students and staff. And you can see in that slide that students own their own IP, which is actually fairly typical, if not universal in universities. In terms of accomplishments, uh, he says, much of our accomplishments have focused on either uh, in our direct assistance to open work communities or in the education and connecting of various stakeholders in the open work field. Primarily during our first two years of operation, we provided direct assistance to faculty creating, maintaining, or contributing to open works in the form of tailored consultation and direct assistance specifically for community development. 
This assistance involved developing community roadmaps, creating materials and documentation for assisting contribution and design feedback. As part of this assistance, we contributed directly to various open source projects and programs such as the Chaos Community, that's Community Health Analytics for Open Source Software, uh, through their Values Working Group and Grimoire Lab, as well as the IEEE SA Open Platform. On top of direct contributions, we promote education and dissemination of knowledge through various networks that we support. One such example is the Open Work in Academia Summit, which uh, RIT hosted in September, that drew 80 speakers and attendees from government, industry, philanthropy, and academia. Uh, check out the page linked here in the slide for more information on that summit. We're continuing this work by developing asynchronous working groups to develop solutions to the issues discussed in the summit through our open work network. Finally, we made it a priority to continually disseminate our learnings and methods at various conferences, meetups, and online communities such as the Linux Foundation events, FOSS Backstage, and Sustain OS, and plenty of others. And if you go to the OpenRIT website, they have a lot of those resources available there. Uh, Daniel Schoen, who's the head of the OSPO at St. Louis University, sent uh, these, these notes that I'll read. There was uh, an interest in open source and open scholarship and appetite. Uh, help and assistance across the university. Uh, but the pace at which students work is different than the pace at which a full-time developer, whether a researcher or software engineer works, even when the students are given additional structure and support. Uh, a good project for our teams is usually something with well-defined outcomes and tasks that support research, developing software that itself is computer science or computer engineering research as possible, but maybe not the best fit for the OSPO. Socializing a new program takes time, even with enthusiastic support from key administrators. Everyone is busy. The initial focus was internal university constituents, but the program quickly opened doors for many external collaborations. Uh, OS SLU's programs focus on developing research software overlaps and extends resources in our research computing group. Uh, and OS SLU's program's initial approach as a software development agency overlaps with emerging professionalization of research software with organizations like the U.S. Research Software Engineering Group. In terms of accomplishments, um, OS SLU started work this spring on a mobile app for ethnography field notes that is funded, and there are additional funded and unfunded and partially funded uh, development opportunities emerging leading towards a path to program sustainability. We realize that the unique nature of our teams means that we need to spend in time on internal training and documents on how we work well. We have made our project solicitation and selection process clear to find our best fit projects. A listening tour with each department across the university is a slow but effective way to socialize our program with faculty. External partnerships with groups like Launch Code are available. A close relationship with our research computing group has been vital. There is an emerging community of interest around open scholarship and open data within our libraries and across our university that we've been able to tap into and advance. So finally, I will come to Carnegie Mellon. Uh, you've heard this before. I was mentioning with Bill earlier that you will find there are areas of overlap and then also differentiating aspects of what, what's happening in our OSPOs, which is maybe a healthy sign. Uh, open source is everywhere. You might say, well, sure, at Carnegie Mellon, it's everywhere. But uh, I'll ask you this question. Is there software at your institution? Uh, and then I'll point out that depending on recent estimates and reports, between 95 to 98 percent of all software either uses open source or is released as open source. So if there's software being produced at your university, chances are there is open source software. But even at a place like Carnegie Mellon, you don't know what you don't know. So a faculty member may know something about software engineering practices, but they don't necessarily know about licenses. They may know something about teaching with open source software, but they don't know about research applications. So the OSPO sort of positions itself as being a, a consultant, if you will, around the whole aspect of open source software, and it's rare to find any specific individual who knows all of those. There are very different social norms uh, and a different ecosystem around software. Faculty are more willing to share their software than they are even share their data. And once they give their articles to publishers, share their articles. So the idea is that they are maybe more amenable to getting help, even though um, you know, they know a great deal about how to produce the software. They don't necessarily know about community building. They don't necessarily know about how to share it and sustain it. Uh, we heard this earlier, that it's a key part of the overall open science program. 
uh, at Carnegie Mellon Libraries, and that Carnegie Mellon has a facility called Cloud Lab, which has been discussed at previous CNIs, and we're having explorations with that group about how to open up that infrastructure and those workflows. It is a key part of how people you, you know, educate. Uh, so open source software projects as a laboratory, the Semesters of Code project that Bill described. And we found that it is a more seamless way to work with communities outside of Carnegie Mellon in a way that builds trust and transparency. We can talk more about that. Uh, I do need to point out that security is a major concern. Uh, we had the director of the Cyber Infrastructure and Infrastructure Security Agency, Jen Easterly, speak at CMU uh, last month and gave a talk called Unsafe at Any CPU Speed. I encourage you to take a look at it. Uh, she does a great job of outlining the issues, but how open source can play an important in addressing those issues. In terms of accomplishments, we've hired a community manager. Uh, this is a person who's going to help build that community within Carnegie Mellon, particularly with the students, providing support for hackathons, internships, and so on. I think these are the kinds of new roles that will come about as we start to explore open source more uh, intentionally within universities. You've heard the importance of working with Tech Transfer. I'm glad to note that we have a very strong partnership with the Tech Transfer Group at Carnegie Mellon, which has produced a guide for helping you select licenses, and now we're thinking about whether that can be extended throughout universities. Uh, I talked about this Cloud Lab, so it was created uh, in the Bay Area to work with startups who don't want to share their information with each other but we are now finding ways to open it up and open source software will play a key part of that. Uh, the Semesters of Code course that Bill had mentioned uh, taught by Stephen Wall at Microsoft, he's planning to teach that at Carnegie Mellon uh, this summer and hopefully this fall as well. Uh, and Carnegie Mellon is also the home for the Software Engineering Institute. It is a federally funded research and development center that is the DOD's software uh, arm, if you will. And they are very interested in security, as you might imagine. So we've uh, been working with them directly in terms of thinking about those issues. And you also heard about the chaos group. Uh, so Stephanie and I have agreed to co-chair this group that will look at metrics around open source software within the university contracts, including how they relate to promotion and tenure. So there are many people working across all of our institutions and our institutions are providing support, but there's no question that without the Sloan Foundation funding, this whole movement would not have started, so we do want to acknowledge that. Uh, and we do have some time for questions, comments, and discussions, so please, uh, we'll open it up to the floor, and thank you for your attention. Not sure if this, oh yeah, I, I, I'm hoping the mic in the middle works, so you can give it a try. I, I see our, our excellent yeah. support person in the back is nodding, so yes. Uh, thank you. You all seem to have um, different administrative homes for your OSPO. Uh, after some experience, could you tell us where you think it most likely should live at a new, like an institution like mine? On. Oh, hello. Yeah, um, so that was actually one of the things when I was talking about being flexible. Um, we originally assumed we were going to be um, in the um, Office of Research, uh, but, uh, and part of that was because we had a very significant um, champion with as at, who was the Vice Chancellor of Research at the time. He moved on and is now part of the Office of the President uh, at UC, at, at University of California. Um, so there was a little bit, there's a little bit of like, oh, maybe that, you know, there was a little bit of back and forth now. So we're not actually, right now, we're actually sitting still in the School of Engineering, but ultimately, even the dean from, I think, from the School of Engineering was, yeah, we see that this needs to be more campus-wide and not school-specific. So, um, and I know a lot of, there's different uh, groups that, that will be here, but I think we ultimately see ourselves being, um, in, for, for our campus, being under uh, the Office of, Office of Research but we're flexible about it. So. I'll add to that, so like, uh, mine exists in the library and the co um, College of Engineering and Statistics. So like, we're kind of in this netherworld that, like the library is a good place in the sense that you cross all the colleges, you can go across that space, but I mean, like literally having just did annual review, one of my goals is to like actually write out like, hey, this is the formal place where it should probably exist. And I think some of that is in the Office of, of Research because like so a lot of things we're gonna touch is consulting on research. But it also comes a point of like, we're all funded, but well, not, I should say I'm funded by Sloan entirely. So like, if I develop funding structures that like right now I'm not from the, I'm not getting funded from the university. So if I develop funding structures that don't require the university, it doesn't entirely matter if I stay in the, in the it's best to be in a place where I'm not in a specific college. But outside of that, 
If I can figure that out, then it doesn't matter as much. Yeah, I, th I think what you've heard is that there's, there's no one right answer. It depends on the institution and, and how, uh, how the needs are, are best uh, approached. At Johns Hopkins, it does sit within the libraries as well. And that works well because libraries is both a, a point of collaboration and a neutral space. Uh, so where all of the schools feel, feel confident that they can come and, and get resources from the library. But also from, from a funding standpoint, the library makes sense because it's able to, to build on the existing funding models that bring in uh, the, the work from all the different schools to, to make things uh, available in a central location. Uh, so it, it's probably clear what I think, given that I've been involved with both Hopkins and CME OSPO and it's in the libraries. Um, the, the other piece I'll add to this is the curation function. So the idea of curating the research outputs um, and tying it to broader open science programs, integrating it with data management services and so on. Um, but probably what's most important if you cut across all these, and I believe, well, I know that RIT's program is in the Vice President for Research Office, and I believe St. Louis University is in computer science. Mm -hmm. So what you're hearing in, in essence is who has the credibility to talk about open source software, right? So naturally colleges of engineering and computer science and maybe libraries have that. But where can you get a university campus-wide service that is viewed as being neutral so that it doesn't end up feeling like this is this division's thing, so I don't want anything to do with it. Um, the, the Carnegie Mellon has a school of computer science, which has seven departments in it. Um, but even in the short time I've been there, I've learned that if something goes into computer science, it almost feels like, oh, well, it just went into the 800, 800 pound gorilla and it's not for me. Um, so those are some of the issues I think you want to explore. I am Matt Marinick from the National Center for Atmospheric Research. So I want to pick up on, I think, uh, Bill, you mentioned uh, when you were showing the charts about the diversity of open source uh, software in general. And we've definitely seen that in our organization, looking at, you know, what's within our GitHub organization, uh, within our organization, uh, there's, there's a variety of levels of maturity, let's say it that way, uh, in software from, you know, very complete, very kind of community oriented to it's just people throwing stuff up there on GitHub and, you know, it's their own individual software for their own purposes, but it's still open source in some sense, at least it's openly available. Um, so my question is, how do you, uh, kind of how do you work with different groups along this maturity level, uh, and sort of how do you approach also community building um, when you have this large diversity of sort of software building kind of, uh, you know, models? Let's start there. So I, I think part of the, part of the expectation is that you're, you're, you're going to have different needs coming from different projects. And some projects really aren't that interested in doing more than just setting their code out there and saying, have at it. If you want to touch it, great. Um, but others are, are thinking a lot longer term. They want to build community. They want to engage with other institutions or others who are, who are doing that software work outside of the institution that you're in or outside of the group that they're currently working in. So it, it's really coming back to what, is, what are the goals of that, of that group and helping them to take that next step forward because you're, you're not going to be able to uh, push them in a direction that they don't want to go anyway. So it's, it's I, I guess we, we see the OSPO really as an, an engagement and a collaboration uh, role where we can have a conversation and say, okay, th these are the things that we see that you're doing, where do you need help? And maybe we can point out some things like, oh, have you thought about this? Have you thought about this? And, and take that to the next level and then say, okay, this is where you are. So continue that conversation. And if you know if they have specific questions and we can get those answered, bring in people that know those things well, then we can help in that regard as well. I think too that it's a, it's a really good question because it's something I've really struggled with about like how to approach that. Um, there's kind of two ways to think about it. One is pipeline, so like teaching students to know what this looks when it's done well, um, and that's something that. Educationally, like creating courses, or I mean, honestly, a lot of it I want to do active projects where they're engaged with like real work in open source communities because you kind of learn when you're out there, like, oh, I can't do this because like you can tell them, but also they learn from experience. And for students, that makes a lot of sense. They're willing, they're there to learn, they're willing to engage with that. For other members inside of the university, it may not make as much sense. Um, a lot of the tech transfer stuff is kind of like it's more. Um, it's kind of like therapy, it's like, what do you actually want from this, right? So like if you have those conversations, they kind of get that point of what does, what are their goals? What do they want to achieve? And then we sit there and say, okay, so if you want to achieve this with open source, 
and you want it to be at this level, you need to do these kinds of things and it requires this work. To set that expectation realistically, because like, your point, you can just put it out there. It doesn't mean it's gonna go anywhere. It doesn't mean anyone's gonna contribute to it. And if you wanna create something that's actually healthy and competent, like it requires actual work. And the question is like, do you have appetite for doing that work? And if not, like, is there someone else that would take on that project to, to grow that community? And that is, that is like juggling in a university, right? Like who actually has capacity, who has the time, who has incentives to actually do that work? And that's something that's always gonna be different any given day. Um, but I think it's a really important point of being like clear with someone in those spaces, like what the work is if they wanna actually grow that at a, at a higher level so they're not surprised and they're not, they don't feel tricked and be like, hey, you know, there's a lot of things that are involved in this doing this right and then give them opportunities to learn those things. Um, and it's definitely like it's not dictatorial. Like you really have to work and identify and meet them where they need to be to make that work that way. Yeah, I, I think I definitely second everything that's already been said. And then um, we look at it for also from a, we have kind of a three pillar approach to how we've, and that it was a bit of a carryover from the research center from Cross is that we focus on research translation and the research itself, as well as the mentorship and education. And so we have like different programs that focus on that. And to deal, I think to deal with a lot of the um, translation uh, of one focus has been uh, for us as being supporting uh, those like, who are like in a postdoc who have graduated and helping them kind of create communities uh, around their organ, around their, um, around their, um, around their project, but also uh, having them be what we call the ambassadors. Um, and help create kind of a community within the entire system. So people have something to, so others who maybe aren't necessarily part of one, you know, one of our fellows will be able to look and see a model that they can follow. And we can, they help us to establish best practices for, for those in that level. So that's kind of that, you know, that higher level of like, these are the project maintainers, these are folks who actually really do want to kind of continue their project and help create a community. Um, we also have the research, like we also have support for uh, graduate students who are work, whose research have have a kind of a plausible uh, path towards an open source project, um, and they're kind of we treat them differently because they're obviously working on research and they're PhD students and they need to get their PhD. Um, so, but they also we support them um, at a kind of a different level. So I think it's kind of that idea of you. It, it depends on you know you you kind of want to sit back and say well what do you need from us and help create a number of different options. Um, and then for students, in particular for undergraduates, we have a number of mentorship programs where we're like, okay, this is a great way of bringing, uh, helping the pipeline, helping um, create more talent in the open source communities um, in ways that are very positive so that people have good experiences when they, when they come to an open source community, which is a huge problem, I think, in open source in general, that necessarily, that first, um, first time that they work on open source sometimes isn't positive. So we wanna make sure our, our, stu our especially our undergraduate students um, feel uh, welcomed and feel included within uh, within within open source communities in general, but in particularly within the ones in our that you know that come out of the University of California. And Pose. And Pose, right? So yeah, I was gonna say the Pose, the Pose project, of course, has been great. I mean, that's been a really useful way for us to kind of look at how to create an infrastructure, and we kind of see it um, as being a great way of figuring out like what's a what's something that um, how we can create some sort of sustainable. <coughs> method for um, for all of our, um, our for, for, well, for one pro project in particular, one ecosystem in particular, but how we can actually create a model that we can then use moving forward for, for other work. So that's NSF, Pathway to Open Source Ecosystem. It's a grant that's funding developing ecosystem around a given open source project. Yeah, yeah, and we have, we like as I said, we have one phase, one project that's been, it's been a great way for us to also see, envision a, like a sustainable way um, to uh, move forward and not just have projects that, uh, you know, that, that don't, they can't make that next leap because they, they, they don't have an infrastructure. So that's been really helpful for us. So I think one of the pathways for sustainability of OSPO is well to create services, right? And one of those services I think is curation. So we have too much software, actually. We, we don't need more. Um, and just to be quite blunt, many of the things that are just put on GitHub don't really merit getting the kind of institutional support we're talking about here. So that curation function I think is critical. And one of the reasons I argue for the library being the home for the OSPO is there are existing services that you can build on, right? So there's Python training, R training at Carnegie Mellon Libraries. That's a great place to help people learn about Git. It's a great place to learn about DevOps practices and so on. 
So I think of those services as a set of concentric circles, right? And in the core are the types of things that many, many, many people need to learn the basics. And I think libraries are really good at that. And as you get further and further away to very specialized needs, like the Pittsburgh Supercomputing Center, where Carnegie Mellon has a lot of relationships, uh, I don't know that the OSPO is ever going to be able to support those kinds of specialized needs. So it, it's a service, you know, sort of development effort. But I think we can learn a lot from what we've done with data management services, for example. I'm preaching to the choir. <laughs> so we, we are at time. If, if someone has another question, I, I, I won't speak for everyone. I'm happy to stay, but we can stay. But if you need to leave, of course, that's totally fine, too. Um, is there one more question, that burning question people want to ask? You? You're welcome to come up here afterwards as well. <laughs> yeah, so just come on up. So we'll, we'll call it there. Thank you. Welcome down. We'll come down.